Hello and welcome everybody to this event, Mental Health Matters for Artists, which is an event by Roscommon County Council in conjunction with the first Fortnight Festival. My name is Mary Mullins. I'm a psychotherapist, counsellor, speaker and trainer on issues of mental health. And in a previous life, I worked in the arts. Uh, today's event is very much a fusion, if you like, of the arts, in this particular instance, uh, writers and writing and mental health issues. We're very fortunate to have today with us three of the shortlisted writers in the Neurost Common Writing Awards 2020 and indeed the overall winner. So we will be hearing from those three writers shortly and um, I'll just explain the format of today for you. I'll introduce the first writer, Anne Byrne, who will, who will read her piece to you, after which I will do a short presentation on loss, grief, in times of COVID-19 and how it impacts on the arts and artists. I'll then be calling on the second writer we have here with us, Helen Cunningham, who will read her piece, Splitting Logs, and I will then go on to um, talk briefly about resilience and the importance of resilience, particularly in these times. And uh, coming up to the end, then I will ask Margaret Dehan to read her piece, The Awakening. Following all of that, we will have a brief discussion between uh, the writers and myself just on their pieces and we'll be pulling out strands of mental health issues from the three pieces. And now I'd like to invite Anne Byrne, the overall winner of the 2020 Neurist Common Writing Awards, to read her piece entitled Life. Life. Roscommon Jail, Connacht, Ireland. 1807. They say I killed my son. That's why I'm here. My other boy died still a babe. We buried him on the road. I couldn't tell you where now. All I know is that the fields were sparse and lumpy and there was a tree. I remember that, a large oak tree. We left him there, barely a hand's breadth of earth above him, a broken little sparrow of a thing. We'd sat a while after that, Porrick and myself. He climbed into my lap. I stroked his head, wisps of hair coming away in my hand. There were blotches on his skin, and his breath was as foul as a slop's pot. I cursed my dead husband. He'd been older than me, already two wives buried by the time we married. He had some land, though, a few cattle. Still, I'd go limp when he'd crawl in beside me, pretend to be asleep. He remembered the great hunger of the forties. It made him mean. He caught me once, throwing potato water to the pigs. I remember the smell mostly, the heavy stench of rotten grain as he pushed my face into the swilling mush. I was glad when he died. He'd left instructions for his wake with the priest and coin enough for a decent send-off. I drank and ate and keened until my stomach bulged and my eyes grew raw with effort. The sheriff's men arrived a few days later. We were to leave. No rent in months. I begged, pulled at a booted leg. I'd sell the cattle Kill the pigs. Not enough, he'd said, kicking me to the ground. A crowd had gathered. Someone pulled the childer off me. Get up, Betty. Come on now. Gather a few bits before they knock the place to the ground. I might have moved, tried to stand, but I was on my knees when the thatch went up. We stayed the night in a barn. We slept in ditches only the dark above us. I'd saved a small cooking pot from the house. It was all I could carry with Seamus tucked against me, crying and moping for the breast and a small knife. I made broth from nettles, mushrooms and things. I'd send Porrick to find milk. But it was never enough, the little bit he got. Seamus stopped crying after a while 
but his head would hang funny and he'd look through me. We weren't long on the road when he died. I didn't notice till I felt a chill on my neck, it getting cold without the scrap of his breath again. It. I said nothing, just kept on walking. The leaves of the oak tree were ruby, like crushed velvet. Up close they were thin and veiny, like the back of my hands. I put Seamus down, started clawing at the earth. Porrick helped me. We didn't speak. We covered the ground with as many of the fallen leaves as we could find, just to, to soften the look of it. I scratched some swirls into the bark. Then we slept. We were heading north. I took to carrying Porrick for a bit. He didn't stop me. I washed his feet at night after I'd stuck his blisters with the hot blade of my knife. We kept to the river. I knew where I was going now. My husband had a son up in Roscommon somewhere. Owen, his name was. They hadn't gotten on. My husband used to curse him, so I guessed he might be all right. He'd gone back to his mother's kin after she died. My own parents were dead. I could think of nothing else. We had water aplenty. We'd try to wash, but we only had the clothes on our backs. I could smell the growing sweetness of our stench. It drew the midges. They'd rise in a cloud at evening, coming off the river. In your ears they'd get, or down your neck, or in your hair, drive you mad with itch. I don't know how Porrick did his bit of fishing, the way they swarmed about him, but he'd stand still as a heron, not moving till something flashed in the water beneath him. There'd be evenings too he'd get nothing and I'd have to call him cause he'd go into a sort of a trance and I was afraid he'd vanish into the greyness that fell with the dusk and be gone from me too. But he stayed with me, my silent boy, though his flesh shrank and tightened around him and his eyes grew large and dull. The road got busier as we moved away from the lake. We passed a few scattered cabins. There was a smell in the air, thick and meaty like a herd of cattle that turned my stomach. The broken walls of a castle rose in the distance. Plumes of turf smoke dirtied the sky. I stopped, not wanting to get too close with the night nearly on top of us. There was a lane ahead, a narrow turning off the road. Twas there we found it, a knocked asunder little place, but it had a, a roof of sorts and four walls and a door that limped on its hinges and that air of neglect that told me that there'd be nobody looking to turn us out. I roamed the ends and the streets looking for Owen. They'd look at me with narrowed eyes, the innkeepers and the market sellers, ask me to repeat myself, that they couldn't understand the quickness of my speech. And they'd shake their heads and turn away, and that was all I'd get. As the days passed and seeing as we needed some ways to make a living, I did the only thing I could. I still had my figure and my long dark hair and most of my teeth. The men didn't care how the cabin looked. And with a bit of coin, myself and Porrick set to making it right. I bought a few candles, cups and plates and things, some rolls of cloth. We gathered rushes to fill the gaps in the thatch and made some daub with clay and straw to patch the walls. There were days Porrick would disappear He'd return with bits and pieces, tools and the like, some coin, a bird or two for the pot. I'd never ask. He wouldn't tell me anyway. I watched him grow into a quiet young man with shadowed eyes and a crumpled brow. I started to taking in lodgers. I was getting too old for the other thing. 
I should have known with the last one though. He wasn't the usual sort. His breeches alone were worth a pretty penny. Silk, I think, over a fine pair of leather boots and his coat, a drenched red velvet thing that nearly took the strength of my arm when he handed it to me. And there were flecks of gold in his waistcoat, primrose yellow swirls of it and a full pouch on his belt. He was bearded, but young enough behind it. He'd gotten caught in the storm, needed a bed for the night, and he'd stepped past me afore I had thought or time to think about it. I was ready in the room when a hand caught me about the head, pulling my throat back. I could feel the blade against the, the tight stretch of my skin, the wet heat of his breath in my ear. Porrick, he'd whispered, where is he? Where is the thieving bastard? I tried to reach for the knife in my pouch, but he had me pulled so tight again him that I couldn't move. I could smell him, the damp musk smell of him, feel the weight of his body again me, the scratch of whiskers on my cheek. I couldn't think. I just hung there, face to the heavens, mouth open, trying to force the swallow down the bend in my neck. He pressed harder on the blade, but I couldn't speak. I wouldn't anyway. I closed my eyes and thought of my boys. He let go all of a sudden. I stumbled, fell against the wall. There was scuffling, wet sucking sounds, then nothing. When I looked up, Porrick was standing there, blood dripping onto the rushes from the knife in his hand. I knew I'd never see him again after that. I told him, listen, made him help me as we undressed the dead man. I cleaned the blood off the waistcoat with some salt and water. The clothes were a good enough fit. There was coin aplenty in the pouch. I told him, make for Galway, take ship to wherever he could get. I held him one last time. He was stiff in my arms. Part of him was gone, you see, left behind on the road, maybe beneath the oak tree with little Seamus. But I held him for as long as he let me. And there was a bit of softness in his eyes as he turned away. I gathered his clothes, buried my face for a moment in his woolen tunic, then sat with a cup of putching. The cabin was still cold and drab, despite our efforts. Yet, as I sat there, I was sickened for what I was about to lose. I pulled the cloak about me. I'd sit for another while before seeing to the dead man. I walked to town the next day, told the justice what I'd done. I killed my son, I said. He turned on me on account of the drink and I'd stuck him. They believed me. The hearing was quick. People shouted and cursed and spat. I'd said that I'd done it, so there was nothing to prove. And yet, when they passed the sentence of death, I couldn't help but feel sorry for myself. Though I didn't cry or beg for my life like some of them. There was over two dozen of us to be hanged together. We stood a long time waiting for it to be over till a constable came out and shouted for someone to help with the hangings. The crowd surged and bade for blood, but no one had the nerve. So I shuffled forward. I'll do it, I said, till the hangman's found. The constable looked at me, then back to the crowd. He blew through his moustaches and scratched his head. The crowd roared and jeered. He had no choice, really. He took off my shackles and showed me the bolt to release the trapdoor. The first prisoner struggled as he was pulled forward. I tried not to look at him, but then I needed to see, to remember. Twas the least I could do. He spat at me as the noose was placed around his neck. My fingers fumbled as I pulled the bolt, but it slid back with ease and he was gone. Twenty and four people I hanged that day, and plenty since. 
I draw them on my walls with a bit of charcoal from the fire to remember like, so as they won't be forgotten. I got to keep my life, but the only time I get to feel the wind on my face or the sun on my skin is when I'm at the scaffold. I think about Porrick, if he ever made anything of his life, this is it for me. I'll probably be buried here, unmarked, forgotten, but I write this so people might know that we weren't bad people. I'll go to bed now, I'm tired. There's more hangings to be done tomorrow. The chief constable watched the paper burn. One of the guards had found it in her room. History would record the death of Lady Betty, hangwoman, in the year 1807, a most vile and treacherous woman. Thank you very much, Anne, for a beautifully written piece. Um, a very well-deserved winner of the 2020 Neuroscommon Writing Awards. It certainly evoked um, feelings and of the themes of loss and grief and I suppose adversity in, in, in the whole piece. And that's actually um, very fitting as it's what I would like to focus on now, um, the mental health part of this event. So I'm going to be looking at loss and grief in COVID-19 times. And um, our response to COVID, I was very interested in, in the public's response to COVID right across the world, actually in Ireland and in Roscommon. It's very, very similar to our response to the death of somebody. And indeed the feelings, emotions, behaviours, thoughts we're all going through are very similar to what we would go through when we lose a loved one. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about here now. So there's been huge loss because of COVID. We've been grieving the loss in some cases of people, people who have, have died because of COVID, grieving the loss of our health. People have gotten COVID and have been left with fallout from COVID. And in other cases, I know that people haven't attended hospital appointments haven't been able to because the hospitals haven't been seeing them and there's been certainly an impact on people's health. Um, we've also been all grieving the loss of our income and job and artists in particular have been so badly and hit really hard by this. The negative impact of COVID-19 on the art sector will be between 34 and 42 percent compared with 11 percent of the Irish economy as a whole. That's really, really tough to hear. The decrease in the number of jobs in the sector for artists is projected to be between 15 and 18 percent compared with 7 percent in the Irish economy as a whole. So between 1500 and 1900 arts jobs are at risk because of COVID-19. And that information is coming from Ernst & Young. There's research there. If you Google it, you'll find it. So that certainly has been a huge issue for people. Other loss has been our social contacts and social support. And artists are no different to any other human, be human being. Human beings are social animals. We need to meet each other. We need to meet for a coffee, for a chat, for a catch up, whatever. We haven't been able to do that. A loss of expression for artists. Now, I know artists have been um, uh, preparing and developing new work, but the facility and the ability to express that in the form of exhibitions, drama, live music, performances, um, all of that has been lost. Loss of plans and dreams. And we all have our plans and dreams. We plan and dream what we're going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, the end of the year. We weren't able to do that because all of our plans were thrown out in the water and indeed they changed all of the time and fluctuated all of the time, leading to huge uncertainty and loss of control. We were certainly all impacted by our loss of control of our own lives to a certain extent. And when that happens to us, it can develop very, very quickly into anxiety or, and or depression. The loss is undeniably enormous and again, it's very much like our response to the death of a person. And I mentioned control there. I think it's become very apparent that we need to really focus on what we can control and what versus what we cannot control. 
I have many people coming to me who will be so agitated and so anxious about COVID and uh, where it's going, is there a vaccine, etc., etc. And I say to them, look, let the scientists, let the doctors, let the government neff it, let them at it. That's what they do best. That's what they're paid for. That's what they do. Let's us focus on our own individual response to COVID, wearing our masks, social distancing, hand hygiene. Another thing we can control, which is really important, social connections. Yes, we may not be able to meet people, but we can text them, we can WhatsApp them, we can use the wonderful Zoom. We can use all of those platforms to chat to people. We can send a card. I got a card the other day from somebody I hadn't heard from possibly all year, and it was just such a lovely thing. So it's again, it's something within our control, uh, how we connect with other people. Our self-care, we can look after that. It's something within our control again, our diet, our sleeping patterns and our exercise. Our thoughts and our worries. And, and sometimes I think when people are faced with uncertainty and uncertainty about the future, their thoughts and worries run away with them. And they begin to overthink, uh, ruminate over the past and worry excessively about the future. And this is only going in one direction really, and that's anxiety and perhaps depression. So it's really important to catch that early. And this takes a bit of practice but uh, is manageable. Um, our home, we, can, we, can, we have control in our home, and by that I mean we set boundaries. We should set boundaries in our home. Who can visit, who can't visit? If you're visiting, do you call first? By putting simple steps in place, such as setting and maintaining boundaries in our professional lives and in our personal lives, we get a certain amount of control back. So I think it's just important that, uh, to realise that we teach others how to treat us. So the way we behave encourages other people to treat us like that. And the reverse is also true, you know. So if you keep saying yes to somebody all of the time, they'll keep coming after you for stuff. So I'm talking about this in terms of what we can control and what we can't control and how important that is in these uncertain times. And going back to Anne's piece, which is very much about loss and grief, um, our response to COVID, as I said, is very much like our response to the death of somebody. And we do go through various different stages. There are many theories of grief. And one of the ones that sits very uh, comfortably with me is the five stages of grief. And the first of those stages is denial. So I, I found it fascinating when, I was, when we were faced with COVID initially back in March of 2020, how people uh, denied that it was happening at all. And this, this was such a natural process, really. People didn't realise they were doing this, but they were ignoring COVID to a certain degree at the beginning. Ah, it won't happen in Ireland. Um, they were coming up with conspiracy theories. Ah, this is just the government's way of controlling us, etc., etc. And they were using excessive behaviour, excessively eating. Uh, there was the so-called COVID pound, excessively drinking. And... They were doing this to numb the feelings, if you like, of the shock of what was coming down the tracks and a very natural, normal response. Uh, but people quickly moved on to being very angry. And this is the second stage in the process of grieving uh, a loved one. The same thing was happening with this loss in terms of COVID. People began to get really angry. They blamed uh, Neffet, they blamed the government, they blamed the HSE for this, they blamed the Chinese people for this, they blamed other people for not wearing masks, they blamed young people for having house parties. Everybody was blaming everybody else. And the, again, this is a very natural process in terms of grieving loss. Uh, people like to blame somebody, they get very angry. People protested, was another way of venting their anger. They went to Dublin, protested against wearing masks. People took to social media and talk radio. And I, for one, used to listen to the radio a lot at the beginning of this, back in April and May, when the weather was beautiful and I was in my garden. But I had to give it up because there was so much anger being vented all of the time. Um, I just thought this wasn't good for my own mental health. And I suppose a really sad part of all of this anger, it was directed, unfortunately, at family members, vulnerable family members. And the rates of domestic violence uh, have certainly increased in 2020 and I, I noted that there was um, a lot of reference to violence and domestic violence in Anne's piece as well. 
and a new report from Safe Ireland in November shows that a total of 3,450 women and 589 children who had never contacted a domestic violence service before had now looked for safety and support from abusive and coercive control during the first six months of COVID. So that equates to 19, one nine, new women and three children every day. So that's really, really distressing and uh, is, a, is a hard fallout, if you like, from this pandemic. Um, people were, are, have been and are still very angry. So we move on to the next phase, which is bargaining. And this is the third uh, stage in, in the grief. If I do this, then that might happen. Maybe if I do this, this won't happen. So people, again, I found it really interesting. Um, with the lockdown levels, we all said, well, if we do what we're told and if we don't go here and don't go there, maybe the virus will go away. Maybe it'll go away. This is all our innate response to try and keep us sane and safe. We distracted ourselves with new skills, baking, cooking, knitting, exercise, all of this. Anything to, again, distract ourselves from the reality of what was happening. Um, we said if we work from at home, we don't have to go out, maybe we won't get the virus if we shop online. So people were saying, if I do this, then that. And that was fine and good for a while. And then reality kicked in with the second lockdown and people began to see that this was a long term thing. It was no longer short term and people can put up with short term uh, pain for long term gain. But it's 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 difficult when it goes on and on and people see no end um, in sight. There is a vaccine coming in in place now and we have hope in terms of that. But this fourth stage in the grieving process is called depression and it's called depression for a reason. It's when our feelings get depressed or pressed down and we find it difficult to be happy and to be optimistic and to be motivated. The novelty was gone, the second lockdown, the, there were no holidays, no weekends, no day trips, no cinema, theatre, concerts. Artists were really, really struggling and have been struggling since that second lockdown. People got cabin fever. They were sitting on top of each other all day long with the same people. And a similar thing happened to people as happens at Christmas time. Their people are lovely for a while and after a while, you kind of have enough of them and you want them to move on and wherever. And it's just very difficult because these are unnatural um, circumstances. And then the winter set in and the gloom and the cold and the dark and the never ending dark. And of course, um, there are a number of people who are affected by the seasonal adjustment disorder syndrome. When the seasons adjust, people, a certain percentage of people get what's called sad and uh, they need the light. So again, this wasn't helping. And this depression in the phase, in the stage of grieving is a normal response and people move through it and move on to acceptance. However, what happened in, during COVID was people got really stuck in this stage of depression and their grieving depression uh, turned into clinical depression for a lot of people. Um, they found it very difficult to be positive about anything, to be positive about the future. So numbers of people with depression have increased and number of the number of people getting prescriptions for anti-anxiety medication, anti-depression medication, um, ha sleeping tablets, that has all increased. Anxiety is another byproduct of all of this. People are much more anxious than they had been in the past. And of course, the danger with this is that if you are in a state of chronic stress or anxiety for a long number of time, it can turn into depression. The final stage that people reach when they're grieving the loss of a loved one, in this case, grieving the loss of everything that we lost during COVID is acceptance. And that's where we would hope that people would come to, accept that there is a new routine, there are new work practices. We can use Zoom, and Zoom is indeed for me a blessing. It's also equally a curse because it works and it doesn't work. But it, indeed, it has allowed me to keep in touch with people all over the country and, and abroad and all over the world. We have WhatsApp, we have Team, we have other um, uh, platforms like that. We, have, we look after ourselves 
we accept that we can't go to gyms anymore. People who go to gyms, but we can do stuff at home. We can go for a walk, etc. So I suppose the biggest part of this acceptance phase is resilience and whether or not people are resilient. Resilience really, I've often thought, is when you're hit by something again and again and again and you get up again and again and again. And people have discovered their levels or not of resilience during this pandemic. And I will be talking shortly about resilience and the importance of resilience and how to develop resilience. But first of all, I would like to ask Helen Cunningham, uh, a runner up in the 2020 Neuroscommon Writing Awards, to read her piece, which is called Splitting Logs. Splitting Logs. The noise of the axe is like the sound of a shotgun reverberating through the silent stands of pine. To creatures living amongst us trees, it signifies trouble, a reason to disappear. But Paddy sits patiently watching as I systematically chop the decaying old wood. The dry summer has seasoned it well. I divide into three, branches for kindling, even logs for splitting, and the odd shapes to stay on the forest floor. There should be a good crop of mushrooms by the autumn. I marvel at the pattern of life in my wood. The dog, hearing the rumble of the car first, pricks his ears and turns his head to stare down the boreen. He lifts his knowing eyes to mine, troubled. The visit, I murmur to him. Go if you want, boy. He bounds off through the trees to the cottage up of the hill, sure of a warm welcome. I am hidden and watch her as she parks and surveys my home. I know she sees the peeling walls and the sagging gutters, the encroaching greenery of shrubs long neglected. Looking west, she stares out at acres of fertile fields, good land for my heifers and their calves. I see her march to the door and go in. I imagine her poking about, opening doors, checking cupboards, wanting to meddle, to manage. I wonder why she has come. When I enter my kitchen, she is startled and then immediately begins the familiar badgering. Daddy, where were you? Seeing the tools, she frowns. Why can't wood when you've turf? She pauses briefly. Rory has brochures for the new bungalows. Check them out, Daddy. They're going quickly. She looks so like her mother, whose gentle presence is still here in our home, despite all the years since she passed. But my daughter is blunt and businesslike, traits learned from husband Rory, auctioneer and seller of land. I shrug and we pass the next half hour circling each other. I make tea and talk of cattle and marts. She informs me that my house will be snapped up by escaping Brexit Brits and the pastures by forestry investors. As she leaves, she casually throws a final punch. Called Brisbane yesterday. Maggie agrees that you should consider the bungalow, Daddy. Better in the long run for you and us. I feel gutted that my far away, free-spirited younger girl should have deserted to the enemy without warning. I'm so tired of it all. I use the brochure to start the range. I begin to pack kindling into sacks. As I work, I think of how this place has been a constant throughout my entire life. I have lived and loved here, like generations before me. I'm moulded into its fabric, comforted in the embrace of old walls and the encircling arms of ancient trees. I will surely die here. I hear Paddy's bark, together with a voice of a person that makes my spirits lift. They come through the trees. She hands me a tin. New recipe just for you, she says, pecking my cheek. I'm full of joy. Her face is still thin and her eyes sad, but she's learnt to smile again. I recognise and remember the slowly evolving stages of grief, but it's hard to see in someone so young. Her husband, Matt, was the lad I cherished as if he was my own. His mother was abandoned by my best friend in the cottage up the hill. When she died, Matt kept the house 
and brought Jen over for holidays from England. He too was cut down in months by a cancer so aggressive that none of us could believe his passing. Jen, lonely, lost, and keen to escape the stress of the city, fled back to his home place. It has nurtured her for almost a year now. She calls in most days for a chat, advice, or a mug of tea, constantly curious about life in our rural corner of the West. Slowly she's learning to read the land and the seasons, to understand the patient cycle of life here, despite extremes of weather, feuds between neighbours, and the vagaries of politicians. Gradually, she's healing, the scars of grief fading, but always there. She's like a breath of fresh air to an old soul like me. United by the loneliness of loss, we have become friends. She helps me carry the sacks into the barn and I show her how to stack split logs. Then we sit together on stumps and munch cake. She touches my hand. I have news. The Birmingham house is sold. It should all be done in a few weeks. I study her carefully, looking for signs of regret. There are none. So you'll definitely be staying, I venture? Of course, Jim. I love Matt's cottage. And how could I leave you after all you've done? You've helped me make the first small steps of a new life here. You're my best mate. Then I have an idea. A week later, I'm driving back from Galway, the words of the consultant replaying in my mind. Maybe three months, he'd reckoned. My thoughts are racing at all I need to do. At home, I sit at the table and start to make lists. In the circumstances, it's astonishing how energetic I feel. Later, I start on a second wind-blown tree, vigorously soaring, sorting and splitting. I am still planning. The next day, I trudge nervously to the cottage up the hill and put my proposition to her. She's stunned and speechless. Our tears splatter on the plastic tablecloth. She fiddles at her bitten nails. Are you absolutely sure, Jim, she stutters. I nod and press her hand. Her eyes meet mine and look straight into my soul. Such a shock and so sudden. But I will think about your proposal, Jim. I'm really humbled and honoured with your offer. Flattered too, of course. Just give me a bit of time. For days I wander and worry, anxious that I'm being a fool. What would everyone think? Had I messed up the only genuine friendship in years by being rash? I walk amongst the trees, searching for strength in their solidity and resilience. Where the wind has toppled them, young saplings grow from the debris. Sunshine illuminates hidden tracks, as if showing me new paths to follow. She finds me sitting brooding on a stump. Yes, is all she says. I look down so she cannot see the wetness on my cheeks. I'm happy. We sign papers in the solicitor's office with shaking hands and then I take her for lunch at the hotel. I make a joke about being worried that she would evict me from the house. But she doesn't laugh. She's anxious about my daughters. I try to reassure her. There's no hurry. They'll find out in time, I say. In the autumn, they all gather in the church. Jen sits amongst the neighbours and watches the two sisters in the front pew. Neither of them gives her a glance when they file past and she is relieved. They will share her money from the Birmingham sale, so will have no reason to dispute the actions of their father in those final few months. The scars of loss have split open once more and she has no energy for a fight. She is fragile. In the evening, she looks down with sadness on his house from her own and strokes the soft head of the old dog. He was a good friend to us, wasn't he, Paddy? And clever and wise. I think he was really content with the way he sorted everything out in the end. We cannot let him down. 
She knows what she must do. With axe in hand, she strides down through her fields to her wood. More of the pines have been felled by the wind. More spitting of logs. Thank you very much, Helen, for that beautiful piece. Um, I suppose when I was reading your piece, I was struck very much by the theme of, again, loss, but also of resilience in your piece and how uh, nature can provide us with um, resilience if we just, I suppose, are aware of and accept that it's there. And certainly the whole theme of the wood and the forest and all that spoke very loudly to me and we'll talk about it shortly. Um, resilience. Resilience is so important to all of us during these times, these COVID times. It's important to artists, it's important to all of us. We, I suppose what I'd like to say about resilience is we cannot change the fact that life throws all sorts of things at us. However, what we can do is change how we respond to all of these challenges. And that is really what resilience is. So the, the awful message is that life is unfair and there's no doubt about it. It seems really more unfair to some people than to others. So the quicker we accept this, the quicker we can move on with doing something about it. And yes, the whole pandemic and COVID and I heard people saying, oh, this is so unfair. We want to do this, this and this. So step back a bit again, what I said earlier, focus on what you can control, leave the stuff you can't control out and try and develop your own internal strength so that you can face off stuff that comes at you. So resilience is really important. It helps us stay calm under pressure. It helps us to reduce and better handle anxiety. And certainly anxiety has been a huge issue during this pandemic. It helps us experience less depression as well. Because if we're, if we're in a good place mentally and if we uh, work on ourselves preemptively and preventatively, we don't need to come to a place where depression has taken over or where anxiety has taken over. And that's a lot of what I am very interested in is the whole area of positive psychology in preventing us getting to that stage when it becomes distressing. Um, resilience helps us identify and solve problems a lot easier because if we're very anxious that some people will say to me they're so anxious that their head is in a fog and they can't think clearly. This is a very normal natural reaction from having too much adrenaline flow throughout of your body. Your brain actually cannot focus that well. Uh, make better decisions. If you're resilient you can make better decisions. Again this is going back to when you're very anxious. You cannot make decisions very clearly when you have a lot of cortisol and adrenaline flowing through your body because you're anxious. Um, so it's how we respond to what happens to us that impacts on how we go on to live our lives. Human beings have an inbuilt capacity to survive tough times and to go on to thrive. But we need to, I suppose, believe in ourselves and tap into that and work at it. It's like learning a new language. It's like learning a new musical instrument. We've got to actually work on this. People go to gyms or they exercise to build up their body and they do it over and over again because they know they have to. We should be doing the same for our mental health, working on it. There are ways to work on it. Um, so we need resilience to bounce back, not only from major mishaps, but also from smaller daily challenges we face in everyday life. And it's amazing the number of people who say to me, Mary, I can cope with something awful going on in my life, like somebody getting ill or somebody dying, whatever, but they cannot cope with the small things like the husband forgetting to fill up the car with diesel and it, they run out, it's, you run out on the way to school or um, the, the carton of milk spills all over the floor. The smaller things in life, it's amazing that people do not have that resilience to cope with those. And they will say to me, yes, I can cope with the big, but not the small. And that's again, going back to anxiety. If anxiety has taken over your life, you can focus on a huge, big event happening. That's nature's way of protecting us from being eaten by the tiger a long time ago. But it's the anxiety that's filtering in and threading through our lives with the smaller things that we need to watch out for. So why are some people better at coping than others? Um, it's to do with our childhood, of course. I, you know, I sometimes smile because everything inevitably goes back to our childhood. It's nature and nurture. Some people are built 
with a predisposed to being able to handle crisis better and to be more resilient. But there is no doubt about it that we're products of our childhood. And if we've had a particularly difficult childhood and resilience wasn't uh, demonstrated by our primary caregivers, we will have issues with resilience, developing resilience later on in our lives. So there is no doubt about it that our capacity to cope later on in life uh, can come from our experiences as a child and that's a huge amount of the work that psychotherapists would focus on. So how do you become more resilient? As I said it's like learning a new skill, it's like learning a musical instrument, it requires practice. So we need to change the way we think because the same old thinking leads to the same old results and we need to change the way we behave because doing things the same old way leads to the same old results. And I often say to people, you know, if you're not changing your behavior, you're choosing that behavior. So if you're not getting up off the couch every day and just going for a small walk, if you're staying in bed all day, if people have depression, sometimes it's very difficult to even motivate yourself to get up out of bed. But if you're not doing that, you're actually choosing that behavior. And sometimes when you look at it like that, it brings, it, it allows you to see that you do have a choice here. You actually do have a choice in trying to promote your own positive mental health and resilience. So often when we're faced with difficulties, we try to change the external factors. We'll, we'll try and change everything else around us, forgetting that if we changed ourselves for the better, we would be able to cope so much better with the external factors. We often focus on fixing the external problems in order to make ourselves feel better inside. And while it's important to develop the wisdom and life skills to create change in our external environment to the best that we can, it's actually more important to learn to cope well again and again and again and that's what resilience is. And thinking, feeling and behaving are all linked and a huge part of coping well is shifting how we perceive the so-called disasters, particularly the smaller ones, and how we respond. And again, counsellors and psychotherapists would do a lot of work around that area. It's not for today though. So finally I suppose what I'd like to say is everybody will experience or has experienced loss in their lives. Grieving is a natural reaction to loss. It's nothing to be frightened of. People will come to me and they'll be very terrified by the feelings they're going through with the loss of somebody or loss of something. Uh, it's a natural reaction. It's how we cope with it. Um, and indeed it is how we cope with it that is the important thing. The stages of loss and grief are normal. It's just when you get stuck in one that the problems and distress arrive and the, uh, arise. And the one that people mostly get stuck on is the depression stage. When they've accepted that this is the new, new reality, the anger has gone at this stage, they're no longer denying it with drink, excessive drink, etc. Uh, the lockdowns were grand initially, but then they're stuck at this. Is this it? And that's the, the time when you really need to pull on your inner resources. And that's where resilience come in, comes in. So with that, I'd like to now invite um, Margaret Dehan to read her piece here today. Margaret's piece, again, I think touches on resilience and loss. It's called The Awakening. An awakening. Dearest darling daughter, five months later I'm sitting here now on our favourite seat out on the landing window, looking out through the billowing white curtain into those ever-changing skies. The view from here is, as was always to us, just like a moving picture, with the sun, moon, stars, clouds, rainbows and birds. Most days I just love to sit here and reminisce. Other daily rituals have changed, but not this one. Despite the difficulties and sadness of continuing my journey alone, the changes and the uncertainties of life, the memories sometimes roll out of my eyes and down my cheek, but only of the happy kind. And today holds great promise. The cloudless sky on the sunny April morning and the wonderful, colourful harbingers of spring red and yellow tulips, pink magnolia blossoms and the ubiquitous daff daffodils seem to whisper, it's me, I'm spring, I've returned again. 
It is my first spring alone since you passed, and spring for me is always a happy time of stories and song and good news, of renewed hope, of growth and rebirth. Everything is happening in nature in perfect sequence. It is moving towards the change of season from spring to summer, when the air warms and white seems to be the colour of the countryside. The seasons seem to be blending seamlessly into each other. At this point, I have experienced all of the five stages of grief. The denial and the overwhelming emotional roller coaster state. The anger as re reality set in and I faced the pain of my loss. So frustrated and helpless. The bargaining stage, the if only and what if and then the depression and dark hole swallowing me up, and sadness of feeling a part of my heart is missing, and crying and sleep issues, and now the acceptance of the reality of my loss when I feel able to begin to move forward. So I want to do something positive. I am emerging from the biggest storm of my life, that storm being the grief which took its toll when darkness engulfed my soul and sank my heart and I shut out the world. But I am ready now for a new chapter in my life. I'm going forward fearlessly, like guardian angel Michael, I envisage pulling his protective blue cloak around me. Let today be a new beginning and let me the best, be the best I can. I imagine the advice you would give me to reconnect with the world and to live my life again in order to be my true self. I have decided to create a circle of life's remembrance garden for you because our poem must go on. I want to celebrate the circle of life by commemorating the five stages in the journey of life. The gift of a new life, the nurture of the child in the sanctuary of the family, the release of the young adult, life's journey itself and destiny, portrayed by worldly experience, never ending, signifying the never ending cycles of birth, death and renewal in nature, in nature even though your journey was cut short. My eyes are then drawn to the hawthorn tree in our lower garden with its five petal blossoms. In Celtic mythology, it is one of the most sacred trees and symbolizes love and protection. Mm -hmm. It is also known as the fairy tree because the Shida lived under the Shkjakjal as its guardians. In the last few weeks, the fierce golden blaze of yellow gorse, which swept through Ireland's hedge grows like wildfire, has given way to the gentler, creamy white froth of hawthorn blossoms. The thorn bush has become bright, luminous and radiant with the overwhelmingly milky white profusions of blossoms, so heavily laden with flowers you can barely see the green of the trees. I can't ever remember seeing the countryside so white before. The flowering of the hawthorn tree was always considered a sign that winter was finally over and spring had be sprung. The tree was therefore thought of as an indicator of change in the seasons or a good weather omen. And so every hawthorn tree has its own story and this will be ours. The garden will be down there by the tree and will have all year round richness of colour. The sentiment will offer an inspirational and memorable visitation experience for me to feel connected to you always. So I set about creating my design, a five petal blossom shaped garden and toil with the soil all day. After the fifth day, it was really beginning to take shape. I sat down under the shkak to rest, ponder and be at one with nature. Tiredness swept over me. Suddenly, my head was spinning full of jumbled thoughts. Five days of toiling with the soil, five months since you have passed on, five stages of the circle of life, 
five stages of grief, five petals on the hawthorn blossom. Sparkles of rainbow colour dust appear and dissipate before my eyes as I feel myself nodding off into a reverie as if spiralling through a vortex and being drawn towards the brightness and the lure and song, lure of music and song. My reverie tells me that I have arrived in a happy place with lots of lovely, jo jolly little people. I approach with curiosity and open wonder, observing and listening. Everyone is dancing and singing. And there you are, playing ring a ring rosy with your young friends. You look ever so beautiful and happy as you dance barefoot and carefree with your friends. You are like a fairy princess. Your hair is pretty with white blossoms in it as it floats in the warm, gentle breeze and swirls around your face. And you are wearing a floaty white dress. It's just like our billowing white curtain. This garden is so enchanting. Nothing is forced. It all feels so natural. Still, I am not fully connecting with all of you until you reach your hand out and invite me to join in. So I join in. Is this really you? Am I experiencing your life as it is now, furthering your adventure in a land so beautiful, all sunshine and no rain? It is as if to me as if gold has been discovered at the end of the magic rainbow. The treasures appear tangible now. Wow, such a magical experience this is turning out to be. My journey has continued, but just not as planned. It feels ethereal. I hear a chant, laugh, love, live, learn, play, relax, enjoy, dream, be happy. The music and dancing seems to be never ending. It seems to be endless until I feel I have danced myself exhausted. My body is now weary. I must sleep. I sit to rest and feel myself nodding off to sleep. My eyes are so heavy and then lightning again as if I feel myself waking up. Oh, it feels so cold now. This is a strange awakening. I look around, listen and feel the air. Spring it is not. I remark to myself that our remembrance garden is looking so overgrown and unkempt. I look up and see the white billowing curtain billowing out into the elements. I was sure I had closed that landing window. I hurry inside to close in the curtain and the window. I notice that the walls are covered with creeping ivy and spider webs are in my face as I climb the stairs. The earth has almost reclaimed our house. But isn't nature wondrous indeed? How long have I slept for? The faded calendar on the wall reads from seven years ago. Thank you so much, Margaret, for that, that beautiful piece. Um, I found it really intriguing, particularly the last paragraph, I suppose. So now we'd just like to have an informal chat, um, the three writers and Margaret, Helen and myself, in terms of your pieces and how it, as I said at the very beginning, how it's, it's almost like a fusion between uh, writing and mental health issues because I feel very strongly that in all three there was uh, a thread, if you like, of loss and grief and resilience as well going through them. So I might just start with yourself, Anne, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. I was uh, interested in your piece. There was so much death in your piece and so much, sad, yeah. so much sadness and grief. Yeah. And yet your piece was entitled Life. Yeah. And really, the title wasn't something that I'd, I had even thought about. And it, okay. it was only as I got towards the end of the piece that that title just seemed to appear almost okay you know I hadn't really set out to write something as dark as that you know but I suppose like life you start off and you don't quite know where you will end up so true so I just let the journey take me wherever 
do you know? Um, and I suppose, um, I suppose really looking back on, on it, um, there's death in it, there's darkness, but I think there's also a thread of, of hope almost because life can throw so much at us, but yet the theme probably is to keep getting back up, you know? Yeah. If yeah. you've got something in life that you need to fight for, for you know, I think that will give you the strength to get up, yeah. carry on. And you know, don't, don't think about what the next knock will be. Try and just enjoy. Look at, I've gotten over that and back on my feet. Yeah. Let's just move it onwards, you know. And your main character certainly had to do that, Lady sure. Betty. Yeah. My God, yeah. she was. Everything was taken from her, thrown at her, taken from yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. And until the very end where she, uh, it, it really struck me, you said um, uh, she, the only time she felt the sun and wind on her skin was at the scaffold. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. my God, um, how powerful, you know. Yeah. That was a huge price to pay for having uh, the sun and wind on your skin. Yeah, but at least she survived. She had life. Yeah. So, like, I suppose going back to the title, for her, holding on to life was important, yeah. do you know? Yeah. So whatever obstacle, she wanted life, you know? She was still alive, you know? She yeah. could still experience the wind on her face, yeah. the sun on, on her skin, do you know? And also, her sacrifices meant her own boy had his life also. Yeah. So I think for her, That's right. that was the thing she was hanging on to. Ah. She sacrificed her own freedom to give it to her son. So she know. was giving life there again? Pretty much, yeah. So yeah. I suppose you can tie the title yeah. back to that also. Yeah. You know? And I'm reminded very much of Brendan Kennedy's poem, I'm sure you know of it, begin just one line. Though we live in a world that dreams of ending, that always seems about to give in, something that will not acknowledge conclusion insists that we forever begin. And I think yeah. that's very much in keeping with what you're talking about there. And, and with you, Helen, you know, I think there's something, there's a drive or in, something innate in human beings that we're not even aware of that, that drives us forward, no matter what the adversity. So uh, I think, and, and I suppose that's about resilience really, isn't it? Yeah. And your piece um, certainly had a lot of, of resilience running through it. Would that be, would that be a fair assessment? I, I agree, yeah. Um, interestingly, when I wrote this piece and the more I've read it, I've realised that instead of the, the man, the, the old farmer being the chief character, in a way he's an equal character with the young woman, Jen, mm. because um, both of them show resilience, both of them learn from each other. She especially lost two people very rapidly and she has scars but she's learned how to be resilient after the loss of her husband mm. that I think helps her cope better with the loss of her friend mm. and she, she makes a decision as she's done before to take on his farm and to take on his dog and the dog of course the dog is very important as well um, yeah and I think the it, whole thing of nature animals yeah and nature is very very strong in all of in in your piece as well Margaret but yeah. in your piece Ellen I think the whole thing about the wood and the trees mm -hmm. and life and death you know wood is supposed to be a dead material uh, and yet it's growing it's constantly evolving and yeah um, I'm very lucky because we, we have some woodland near our house in Roscommon and um, I find walking and working among those trees very therapeutic. Um, there's a whole world there that you don't really know that carries on, is resilient, yeah. evolves um, and I think that should give um, confidence to people when they're very down and certainly yeah. this co the Covid restrictions have affected all of us. I certainly empathise with a lot of what you said about that okay. um, and especially in this time when the days are so short 
in the west of Ireland, they're very grey, there's little light and not much sunshine. Very important that you go out and actually engage with nature in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would help people get through it. I agree with you. There's a whole new uh, focus now on, a, on something called ecotherapy. It's where people actually go, are prescribed to go outdoors and it's not jogging 20k or any of that stuff. It's actually about going out in the fresh air or going by a, a beach, just walking mm -hmm. there or where there's water breaking somewhere, that it's, it's really, really good for you mm -hmm. mentally. Um, so certainly nature comes, comes through very strongly in yours and the animal, mm -hmm. the animal. And that he's the link because um, you, the, the character, your main character obviously had nothing, uh, but she still carried on. Mm -hmm. Some people, especially older, isolated people in the West with the COVID restrictions have found it very tough um, not being able to socialise. But having animals to care for, getting up in the morning to feed your horses, you know, take silage, um, look after your dog, gives you a focus, keeps you going. Yeah, yeah it does, absolutely. Um, and Margaret, if I could move to you just for a minute. Uh, what, what struck me about your piece is the, the it's very visual your use of of colors the rainbow the gold the white the the blossom uh, mm. all the rube, all the different colors you have in there and um was that something that you intended putting into your piece when you were writing it or does this yeah. did this just happen to you no that is what i intended because the dad in the story losing his daughter I had a, a previous story, um, part one to that, where... Oh, part one to this story? Yes, yeah, so okay. part one where they, um, he experienced the loss of his daughter. Well, what they loved was nature and walks and p daisy chains and picnics and, you know, kicking mm. up the leaves or, you mm. know, they just loved to be together outdoors. Mm. And this was a beautiful seat, you know, on the landing where they yeah. sat and they could talk and look out at everything. And it was like a moving picture for them. Oh, that's lovely. You know. Because colour is so important and light is so important, mm. particularly, as you said, Helen, here in Ireland and in Scandinavian countries, people have a lot of the seasonal adjustment disorder. So yeah. they have too little light in the wintertime. And uh, it's so important to get out and use whatever we can mm. or sit by a window or whatever. And on a different note, I suppose, in your piece, Margaret, I was very intrigued by the last paragraph. It seemed to be um, almost uh, contradictory or whatever to the rest of the piece, which yeah. was, was hopeful and forward looking and, you know, bright and colourful and yeah. all of those lovely colours. And then it, at the end, yeah. yeah. It, well, it, in death, you know, in her in him losing her um, you know this in his dream he was able to see her and be with her again and it was it was a beautiful experience for him and it gave him hope but okay. he had that hope already because he wanted to make the memory garden so special and he was down there working and toiling away with nature and yeah so and is there another piece to come on after this you said there was one story and then that there's yeah, this one that we'll we're talking have the about. final is there one, another one yeah but I, i'm going to wrap up say from the first to the you know i'm going to bring in the first one again and oh, even right. before that okay so so it's a work in progress it is yeah <laughs> all right and again to call it an awakening was there any particular reason um, well, the first one was called Letting Go. Okay. Um, this, okay. This one is an awakening because he realises that even in death, you know, there's still so much hope and... Yeah. He's, he's still, he's got back to the stage where he, he wants to be positive and create something beautiful in nature. Yeah. In her yeah. memory. Yeah. And Absolutely. they loved being together in the outdoors and this was important to him yeah yeah and i was just wondering in your piece uh, lady betty comes across yeah. of course as very resilient there's yeah. no doubt about that and uh, i have no idea how she did it overcame all of what she did overcome yeah but 
I wonder, is there any part of her that becomes almost numbed to Probably. what's going on in her life at some stage? Because it seems Probably. almost un, too much. Unthinkable, nearly. Yeah. yeah. Has she has she been put on almost automatic? Sort she, of? I'd say that probably would have happened to her, yeah. Do you know? But I think she she um, draws um, the people she has hanged on her walls so that at least she can remember them, you know? That was her thing, was that even though she was the one carrying out the, the hangings, you know, her thing was, well, I'm going to draw each person on my wall to remember them. Okay. You know, so she knew she was doing, like she was doing something, I suppose, she was hanging people, so she was taking yeah. life, but she felt, well, look, at it, if it wasn't me doing it, it would be somebody else. She did that so that herself, she could survive, yeah. you know, but she was giving them back something by saying, look, at, at least I remember you, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'd say she probably had to numb herself a lot to all the trauma yeah. in her life. Yeah. Do you know, but at the end of the day, she was still triumphant in her own way, I she, think. She was, yeah. You know, I know it's a sad story. It's a very sad you know? story. <laughs> and true. And it, um, most of it is. Most of it yeah, is. And she fact. got very bad press, though, didn't she? She did. <laughs> and you see, I suppose my thinking was that Nobody could be as bad as that because yeah. history and the records um, portray her as being evil. And you know, but I thought, That's well, right. she must have some some backstory as to what actually happened that explains how she got from point A to point B. You know, yeah. so we didn't have I didn't have all the information on her because the the uh, record is kind of patchy. You yeah, know, we okay. know certain aspects. So I kind of had to create my own thoughts around why, or like how she ended up like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I was trying to give her, I was trying to, I suppose, provide the motivations for her. And um, Helen, in your piece, is, is, has it been left open maybe that there's another chapter? Because when she was going away with the axe, first of all, I thought, oh my good God, is this going to be a, a dreadful ending here with this axe? But she's gone splitting logs, I hope, yes, with Paddy right. the dog. Right. But I'm just wondering, is there, uh, is there another story there because of the, of the in-laws, of the daughters well, of the I, man? I don't think so. I think the... The, the daughter who was the one who wanted to, for him to move, yes. um, I think she's happy because she got she's the got money. money. Yeah. Um, the other one, I don't know. I mean, there might be another story out of that. I don't there know. But I think, I think possibly she's learning. She's being creative. She's taken on a whole new role, a whole different country. Um, and a bit like me, really, because I moved here three years ago. And although I thought I knew Ireland very well, having been here many, many times to permanently come here. You, you're learning, it's a completely new It's endeavor. different when you're living here. Yeah, and, but, but I think when people are grieving, that is the relearning, the new life you will have when hopefully you get to the final acceptance stage. And I was quite impressed with the idea of creating a garden. So nature again, doing something creative, more permanent, something new, which perhaps would help people move on. So I remember hearing once an old uh, Chinese proverb which said, uh, in order to be happy in this life, we need three things. Something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. So I was just wondering, Helen, in your piece, in your story, if uh, Jen, if she has anything to look forward to? I think she definitely has. I think she, has decided that she is going to stay there. She's going to take on the land and the wood of her old friend, Jim. And she's in a new country and she wants to be part of a new community and learn. So yes, definitely, she has got something to look forward to. And I think she's taken on board the, the resilience of the wood and how you yes. can use a wood and nature to get through things. That's it, exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. 
and I suppose that's a really good place to finish. Um, so what we were looking at today through the lens really of your beautifully written pieces were issues of mental health and um, during this time of COVID-19 and all the loss that has occurred and particularly for artists and the arts community, um, how their, their lives have been devastated. Um, so yes, loss and grief, but there's also the uh, capacity for people to have resilience. And I think that came through very strongly in all of your pieces, the huge amount of resilience that people have and that they find somewhere within. And um, yeah, it's, it's about that, I suppose. It's about making the most of what we have, taking control of the smaller things in life and um, looking at things maybe through a positive lens instead of a negative lens. So I'd like to thank you all very much uh, Margaret and Anne and Helen, that was really, really good. Thanks so much.